at the security door at the front door saying, no, you can't come into emergency, you have to go home. How do you manage to get all this information passed down through to them? Well, luckily I didn't have to do it all. So a lot of people were learning from the radio, from the TV, from Mm -hmm. announcements. We did an awful lot of communications out from the Department of Health. So there's a separate team set up to manage this for health. Mm -hmm. So they did a numerous number of communications. Some of them were global to everybody. Some of them would maybe be specific to the person in charge of pharmacy or somebody who's in charge of emergency department. And then within the hospital, we again did a lot of, a lot of communications down. Every Friday, I'd have a Teams meeting with maybe 50 or 60 of our most senior leaders. And we'd just, this is what I know today. Yeah. And this is what's changed since last week. And this is what could happen next week. And I was supported by my director of infection control, whose office moved up onto my floor. He was so important at the time. <laughs> he was absolutely my right-hand man. And I think our wives maybe thought we're having an affair. We're talking so much. <laughs> so really crucial person. And then communicating through that leadership all the way down constantly. But it was also a time of really coming together with everybody. So I know, for example, we were doing COVID testing clinics now. They were relatively busy, but if there was a case got into the state, everybody would come to be tested at the same time. It was always 3 p.m. on a Friday afternoon it happened. I don't know why, but it was always 3 p.m. on a Friday afternoon. What, they came into the state or well, come for testing? that we would discover somebody had got into the state and normally it would only be one person or maybe two people. And then we would have queues kilometres long of people wanting to be tested. And the staff shift was maybe only set up until maybe 8 p.m. Mm. And we would be running clinics until 2 a.m. So the staff would just all come together. I had admin staff coming down to do the pass out bottles of water. We'd get pizzas in for the nurses' staff again. The admin staff would come down to make sure they got some. Mm. We had other nurses coming in, especially just to help their colleagues out. Mm. So there's a real coming together in it as well, which made me quite proud. Well, that's good. And that's the thing. I think teamwork is really important, isn't it, within a hospital? I noticed that teamwork with nursing is really important and you can't get everything done in a day, but you certainly can pass that on to somebody else and they'll pick it up. So when your staff, Friday afternoon, they're all wanting to go home to their families and start the weekend, it would be turned upside down and they'd all come to help each other by the sounds of it. Absolutely. And they did it time and again. And you said pizzas were delivered. Is that something that, do you uh, organise it? We, I would get, again, the rest of the hospital staff who weren't able to help in the clinic would come together, whether, as I say, passing thousands, and it was literally thousands of bottles of water around a queue, mm-hmm. whether it was directing traffic, because obviously that, all these people came in cars and created mm-hmm. a lot of traffic, sorting out car parks for people to park. Or whether it was actually picking up the phone to a pizza company and it wasn't necessarily Domino's, it could have been a a number of them. I remember my executive assistant picking up the phone one day and saying, how quickly can you do me 400 pizzas? And the guy said, oh, you're joking. She said, no, I'm deadly serious. Can we have it within two hours? And then we had a number of cars turning up full with every single seat space, boot space full of pizzas. Yeah. And then a lot of staff coming out with big trolleys, loading the pizzas, taking them around. Mm. So again, one of the few things I could do other than just say thank you was, well, look, here's a small token and it's only a small token, but it seemed to be accepted in the spirit as meant. Mm. I know nurses really appreciate the fact you don't often see what happens to your patient when they leave, but when they send a chocolate or a card that mm. says, how much they appreciate what you've done for them is really lovely. So that would have been welcomed and have come, people come back and said, thanks all, thanks to the organisation or thanks to whoever delivered the pizzas. Yeah, they, they, they always do. They, they, they're always very grateful and they say they're only small things. But I remember, I mean, years ago, I'm going back 20 years, 
an organization while I was running. We made a, a surplus one year. We actually had a massive flu pandemic. This is in the UK. Mm-hmm. And again, we couldn't get nurses for love and money because they were sick as much as the other members mm-hmm. of the population. Mm. So we actually couldn't fill the vacancies. We didn't spend as much as we thought we were going to. So I bought everybody a 50 pounds boots voucher. Boots is a major chemist within the UK. And we bought a boots voucher intentionally so they couldn't spend it on food for the family. So they had to spend on themselves. Yeah, that's good. And the idea was I gave it to my people and then they handed it down. They, and we all just said, thank you. This is a thank you. And out of 6,000 people, we only had two returned. And both were from doctors. And one was just to say, actually, thank you, but I don't need it. Mm-hmm. And the other one was to say he didn't agree with it, which is perfectly reasonable. Mm-hmm. But again, that I think went down really well because people just said, oh, it's, it's not a big amount, mm. but it's a good token. It's a, a nice thought. So thanks. That's right. It is nice to be appreciated in life and in whatever you do, even if you're just doing your job. Hey, you know what complements great conversations is fine wine, and there is nothing finer than a bottle of Plantagenet wine. Whether you're relaxing after a long shift, at a gathering with friends, or lounging by the fire, Plantagenet wine provides the perfect complement to any occasion. Plantagenet wine is meticulously crafted in one of the most remote locations in the world, using finest ingredients available to create elegant and sophisticated wines that you deserve. Head to plantagenetwines.com for your online order and enter the code NURSES at the checkout to receive 10% off your order with free shipping Australia-wide on any order over $180. So stock up for winter or plan the perfect gift with the most enchanting collection of wines you'll ever try. Head to plantagenetwines.com and enter the code NURSES to start your Plantagenet experience. Conversations with Nurses is proudly sponsored by Fat Burners Only, Australia's number one online supplement store. Nursing is a demanding job and requires your body to be in tip top condition. So, why not head to Fat Burners Only, Australia's go to store for supplements online? FBO provides you with a full range of supplements to support your hectic lifestyles and, of course, the energy and focus you need for those long shifts. FBO has Australia-wide free express shipping so your products arrive at your door faster. And as a special treat for our listeners, enter the code NURSES at the checkout to receive 10% off every order with proceeds going towards supporting this very podcast. Look good, feel great and operate at peak performance with fat burners only. Proudly supporting nurses in association with your number one nursing podcast, Conversations with Nurses. So how did you become the CEO of South Metro Health? Just go back and tell us that story. Well, I started my career as an accountant. I worked in a finance company, banking company. I worked in a logistics company. I worked in a marketing company. And then when I was working in the marketing company, a friend of mine said, oh, I, he worked in hospitals. He told me what he did, and I thought about what I did. And whilst I probably earned more than he did, and you know, it was an easier job, his actually sounded more rewarding. And he, I guess it's why people come into clinical professions is because they want to make a difference. Yes. So I was very fortunate. I, I got straight into healthcare as finance director. And then a couple of years later, I was made the chief executive of a number of hospitals. And that's what I've been doing for the last 25 years. So I applied to come over to West Australia to run Fiona Sandy. And then six months later, they asked me to run the whole of South Metro. Wow. And that's what I've been doing ever since. Good on you. That's good. And like you say, it's very rewarding in healthcare, isn't it? But the team you... The team must make it too because of certain personalities that they are. 
Absolutely. It's a people industry. We mm. use technology, we use computers, we use robots, if you understand me. I have robots that deliver the laundry to the wards and mm -hmm. the impress to the wards, etc. But it's a people organization and it's the people attitude that makes a difference to a great outcome or a poor outcome. And I always say quality is a mixture of safety, effectiveness, and the personal touch. Mm -hmm. And you can have good quality outcomes for safety and effectiveness, but the personal touch is the bit that people remember. Mm -hmm. They do. So then my next question was going to be innovations and that with nursing. Where do you see nurses? Do you think robots will actually take over nurses' jobs or do you think that the nurses will always be there because that personal touch is important? Robots, in my view, will never, ever take over the role of any clinician, whether it's a, a doctor, a nurse, an allied health, maybe a chief executive one day, but not the rest. <laughs> and, and we use robots already, but robots are a clinical aid, a clinical assist. So they will give us more information. They will give us maybe advice. Maybe they're quicker at pulling up a patient's history than we could be by looking through the notes or even through an electronic medical record. Uh -huh. maybe they're able to identify certain trends that we as humans just can't process that quickly. But it's still got to be a, a decision maker uh -huh. and a caregiver. Uh -huh. And I don't think robots will ever take that away. Okay. What sort of innovating equipment or a training do you give for your nurses? Because if things are starting to advance quite quickly in nursing, so I think innovation is a, something we have to embrace. The, the only constant thing about healthcare is change. Mm, okay. Right. 1836, the stethoscope was invented. Mm -hmm. It was launched in the Sunday Times in London. And it's probably the only constant other than doctors and nurses yeah. that's been in health all that time. Everything else is change. And the rest of society faces change all the time. So I don't think it's alien to nurses. What we need to make sure, though, is the change is for the right reason and that we give people good training so that they feel confident with it. And that's what we do. So in, in a number of the hospitals that I look after, we're very IT literate. We spend a lot of time putting people through training programs to use the ICT. Mm -hmm. But also even in, if you do knee surgery, for example, we've got a macro robot in Fremantle, so the nurses again have to understand how the orthopedic surgeon is going to approach doing a partial knee replacement. We have a, a da Vinci robot in urology, and we're about to use that in a number of other specialties. Again, nurses need to understand, because it's very different theatre where somebody is remotely operating on a patient exactly. rather than being stood over them. Yes. So you need different protocols, approaches. But also what we've done in, in South Metro, we've created something called the Cartagen Center. Now, Cartagen is the Noongar word for big dreaming. Mm -hmm. And I intentionally did this. So we have a shark tank pitch. So I sit on a shark tank with a few of my colleagues, a Fiona Word and a couple of others. And anybody can make a pitch to us for an innovation idea. And we've had some amazing ones. So one of our nurses said to us in in her personal life, her husband had to have major bowel surgery. He needed a very bland diet for a while. And she got really fed up. He got more fed up with him and boiled potatoes every day because that's all she knew to do. Mm -hmm. So she came up with the idea of a recipe book of diet that would suit patients preparing for surgery. And I thought that was a great innovation. Yeah. We've had another nurse within our, we run the State Rehabilitation Center. So she said patients who have had major brain injury, often it's repetitive learning. You forget how to brush your teeth. You forget how to comb your hair. Mm. And rather than having staff there constantly, and the patient feel under pressure, I can't remember how to brush my teeth again. I can't remember. She came up with the idea of an app, so a computer app or a phone app, mm -hmm. which would be able to be guided by the patient to remind them how to do things. So it was less pressurized for the patient and less pressurized for the nursing. So we tried to do it two ways. One, we tried to use technology where it's effective. 
Mm. And two, we actually encourage our staff to come up with ideas and they just come up with brilliant ideas. Yeah, it's amazing, isn't it, what people can come up with just when you put it out there or 